Happy New Year. As a church, we begin a new year today. Did you know that? So in our civil society, the new year is always every January the 1st. But as a church, when do we begin the new church year every year? The new church year begins every first Sunday of Advent. What do we celebrate today? Today we celebrate the first Sunday of Advent. That helps to explain why it is that our church is decorated in blue now. We know that traditional Advent colors are violet and rose in some churches, blue in other churches. We'll talk about that in a moment, but we find ourselves here in a new season, which is why our environment has changed and we see blue decorating the church. And so we're in this season of Advent, which for us begins the new church year. We talk about how it is that we've been in the year of Matthew, all of 2014. We've been studying the Gospel of Matthew all year long. Now what happens beginning today? Beginning today, we're no longer reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Rather, for the next year, we're going to be reading from the Gospel of Mark. And so as a church, we divide the readings over three years. In the church, we refer to them as year A, year B, and year C. Year A, B, and C. What's the difference between those three years? It has everything to do with the readings that we have. Back before the 1960s, before the 1960s, for any of us old enough to remember the 1960s, before then, we had the same readings every year. One of the changes of the Second Vatican Council was that the bishops of the church decided to make a three-year cycle of readings so that we could hear more from the Bible over the course of three years. Rather than repeating the readings every year, now what we do is we repeat the readings every three years. So the readings that we had last Sunday, when are we going to hear them again? In three more years. Interesting. The readings that we have today, when are we going to hear them again? In three more years. So now we have a three-year cycle. We refer to those three years as year A, year B, and year C. Last year was year A, and we read the Gospel of Matthew. So if last year was year A, what are we guessing that this year is going to be? Last year was year A, this year is going to be year B. Good guess, right? So this is year B, which means that next year, when we gather for the first Sunday of Advent in 2015, we'll begin year C. A, B, and C. We know that we focus on different Gospels over those three years. We know that in the Bible there are four Gospels. What are the four Gospels in the Bible? In the Bible we have the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so it seems to remember the way, same order that they're in the Bible. In the Bible they're in that order. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In that same order we take them over year A, B, and C. So year A was Matthew. Matthew. What's the order in the Bible? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So year B, what gospel are we going to have during year B? Year B is going to be the gospel of Mark. Last year was Matthew. Now that we're beginning a new liturgical year today, a new church year, the, we're going to start reading from the Gospel of Mark beginning today. So when the deacons proclaim the Gospel today, let's be listening for that because they're no longer going to say, they're no longer going to say a reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Instead, they're going to say a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Today we begin then a whole year of learning more about the Gospel of Mark. That's year B. Year C, can we guess which Gospel we're going to have during year C? During year C, we're going to have, let's see, Matthew, Mark, Luke. So year C will be the year of Luke. We remember that we finished the year of Luke a year ago. And so we'll come back to that. Every three years, we have the year of Luke. What about John? Does John get shortened? John doesn't get his own year, right? Year A, B, and C are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So what about John? We hear John during the Easter season and during certain Sundays of ordinary time. Interesting. So we do hear from John as well. Today, then, we begin a new liturgical year. We're now in year B, not in year A anymore. As of today, we're in year B with the first Sunday of Advent, and we start reading from the Gospel of Mark. 
Can we talk briefly about this season that we call Advent? What is Advent and when does Advent begin? Today is November the 30th. Does Advent always begin on November the 30th? No? Christmas? When is Christmas? Christmas is always on December the 25th, right? It never moves. December is always, December the 25th is always Christmas, so November the 30th is always the first Sunday of Advent, right? You're saying no. How do we determine the first Sunday of Advent then? We always begin with Christmas. Christmas is the 25th of December, and then we start counting backward. So how many, sun, how many Sundays are in Lent? We have four Sundays in Lent, so we take Christmas Day, December the 25th, which always falls on different days of the week, and we simply count back four Sundays. Sandra has a calendar, so today is the 30th, and the next Sunday is the 7th, the second Sunday of Advent is the 7th, the third Sunday is the 14th, and the fourth Sunday is the 21st. Interesting, so we have four Sundays to prepare ourselves for Advent. So the question is, what does that word Advent mean? Advent? We heard that? So Advent, how many of us speak Spanish? In Spanish we have the word venir. Venir. Venir means to come. Advent comes from the same Latin root as venir. Venir, we see in Advent the V-E-N, right? It comes from the same Latin root as, as Advent. And so Benir needs to come. So what is, what is Advent, a season of us praying that Jesus might come? A, a season of us waiting for the coming of Christ. Interesting. We're waiting for the coming of Christ, but actually as a church we talk about the two comings of Christ. The two comings of Christ. Christ came once. When did Christ come for the first time? That was some 2,000 years ago. Some 2,000 years ago, Christ came for the first time, right? Was born in Bethlehem. There were various stories told about this Jesus of history. During our current parish course in Christology, we've been talking about the Jesus of history. The Jesus of history, the Jesus of 2,000 years ago, is the Jesus that was the first coming of Christ. So that raises the question, when is the second coming of Christ? Did the second coming happen already? Or is the second coming still to come? What do we say every time we come to Mass? Our memorial declaration is often, Christ has died, Christ is risen, what? Christ has come again. Christ will come again. You're using the future tense that Christ will come? That's the belief of the church. That at the end of time, we often call it the perusia, at the end of time, Christ will come again. And in fact, one theologian, Reinhold, says that the Latin word adventus, advent, is actually the same as the Greek word perusia. The perusia is the end of time when Christ will come again. When Christ comes again, we call that the perusia. When is Christ coming again? You don't know? What do you mean you don't know? He didn't tell us. According to the Gospel of Mark, not even Jesus knew when the end would come. How interesting. So we have stories of how it is that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, but we don't know when that is. St. Paul... In the scripture, St. Paul thought that Christ was going to be coming any day, which is why we had to be prepared, right? Let's prepare ourselves because Christ could come any day. In fact, St. Paul talks about the Purusha. Do you remember three weeks ago? The first, re excuse me, the second reading from the first letter to the Thessalonians? The first letter to the Thessalonians, we remember, was the first ever book written in the New Testament. So before all of the Gospels, before any of the other letters of St. Paul, the first ever book of the New Testament, what was the first book of the New Testament to be written? The first letter to the Thessalonians. And what does Paul say in the first letter to the Thessalonians? We had that reading three weeks ago. Chapter 4, verse 17, that when Christ comes again, what's going to happen? The dead will be raised, 
And those of us who are living, we're going to be lifted up. Bless you. And we're going to meet Christ in midair. St. Paul believed that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, and that coming again could be any day. So what does that mean if Christ will be coming any day? If, if Christ is coming this afternoon, what does that mean for you? You better be prepared. If Christ is coming this afternoon, you better be prepared. Which is why Advent is time for us to reflect on how it is that we wait for Christ's coming again in glory. And in the meantime, we better be prepared. Right? We better be prepared. We better prepare ourselves for Christ's coming. That's what Advent is all about. It's about preparing us for Christ's coming. And we remember that that coming has two parts. When Christ came 2,000 years ago, his birth, we prepare ourselves to celebrate Christ's birth at Christmas, but also we prepare to celebrate Christ's coming again, his perusia, at the end of time. Which is interesting because at the end of every liturgical year then, these last few weeks, what have the readings been focusing on? Christ coming again. The last weeks of every liturgical year are focused on Christ's second coming. And so as a church, that's what we focus on during these first few weeks of Lent. We focus on his second coming. Then during the end of Lent, we focus on preparing ourselves for celebrating Christmas when he came for the first time some 2,000 years ago. Let's talk briefly about Advent colors. What are the colors of Advent? It depends on what church you attend. Ooh, think about that for a moment. So, what happens is in the Roman Catholic Church, we're used to seeing one set of Advent colors. In other churches, we're used to seeing another set of Advent colors. How interesting. In the Roman Catholic Church, what are the traditional colors of Lent? They've been traditionally violet and rose. Or we all know that violet and rose looks like purple and pink, so often we hear people talking about purple and pink. That the colors of Advent are purple or pink, but actually we know those colors as violet and rose. What's the meaning of those two colors? So violet or purple is a color of penance and penitence. And so it seems that if purple is the color of any season, then we know that it's the season for us to turn around, to repent, and to turn toward God. That's the meaning of the color purple. So it seems that we could use the color purple or violet for Advent, because Advent then would be a time for us to turn around as we prepare for Christ's coming. The color violet, then, is the color that we use for penance and repentance. What about the color rose or pink? It looks like pink. We call that rose. What does the color rose signify? It signifies joy. And so typically, when do we see the color rose in the liturgy? Usually we see that the third Sunday of Advent and the fourth Sunday of Lent. Whoa. So in the Roman Catholic Church, both seasons that use purple as a color, Lent, we break up Lent by the fourth Sunday wearing rose, and we break up Advent, the third Sunday of Advent, we wear rose. Rose is a symbol of joy, and so even though it's a, even though it's a season of repentance, we pause and have a moment of joy. Do we ever listen during the Mass after the Our Father? There's a prayer that the priest says in which he says, as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you ever hear that? As we wait in joyful hope, that really is what Advent is all about. Advent is a season of waiting in joyful hope. Interesting. Which is why since the 1960s, many churches no longer use violet during Advent. No longer use violet, which is this color of repentance and being sorry for our sins. Instead, since it's a season of joyful hope, many churches have changed to the color of blue. Interesting. Why blue? Because blue is the color of boys and pink is the color of girls? No. 
<laughs> so blue is actually a great color because blue is a nice winter color. Reminds us of the winter and the hope that we have in winter. Why? Because when everything is frozen over and iced over in the winter in some parts of the country, is it always going to be snowy and icy? No. What's going to happen? That snow eventually is going to thaw and the flowers are going to come up again and the trees are going to blossom again. So it's a symbol of hope. That color blue is a winter color, which is also a color of hope. But when we see the color blue, who else do we always think of in the church who's often wearing blue? The Blessed Virgin Mary, right? It's the source of many jokes in the church, right? That we always see these pictures of Mary in blue. You'd think that she didn't have any other color in her wardrobe, right? So the color blue also reminds us of Mary. And during these weeks of Advent, we hear various readings of Mary preparing herself for Jesus' birth for Jesus is coming into this world as well. So the American Catholic Church, since being a post-Vatican II church, the American Catholic Church has gone with these post-Vatican II colors for Advent, so that if you notice, we follow the Roman Catholic Church's traditional colors for the entire liturgical year, except one season, and that would be the season of Advent. Because many post-Vatican II churches have switched to blue, the American Catholic Church many years ago made that decision to be a post-Vatican church and to switch to the post-Vatican Advent color of blue. What is the one symbol that we see during the Advent season that we don't see during any other time of the year? It's in front of the altar. During the Advent we always see an Advent wreath. The Advent wreath what is the whole symbolism of the Advent wreath? How many, how many candles do we have in an Advent wreath? The Advent wreath has four candles. What do those four candles symbolize? Why four candles instead of five? Why four instead of three? Because there are four candles for one for each Sunday of Advent. Interesting. So how many candles do we have lit on the Advent wreath this year? So for, excuse me, this week, this week we have one candle lit, which means that on the first Sunday we light the first candle. What are we guessing? The second Sunday, how many are we guessing we're going to light? The second Sunday we're going to light two candles, good guess. The third Sunday we're going to light three candles. And the fourth Sunday we're going to light four candles. Interesting. So four Sundays, we keep lighting one more candle every Sunday. We light the first candle today. We light two candles next week, three the third week, and four the fourth week. What a great symbol that is, because we refer to Christ as the light of the world. Think about it for a moment. When did we celebrate Christmas? We celebrate Christmas the third week of December, December the 25th. Did you ever notice what's happening outside? Last night at like 6 o'clock in, in the evening, I was out grocery shopping and it was dark already. Did you notice that? How it is that the sun is setting sooner and sooner? We have less daylight. The, our ancient ancestors noticed this. How it is that we have less and less daylight coming up to the winter solstice, usually around December the 21st or 22nd. We have less and less light, and then what happens suddenly? It reverses itself, and we have more and more light. What do we have happening with the Advent wreath? We see every week we have more and more light. As we prepare to welcome Christ, the light of the world, as we prepare to celebrate Christ's birth, we have more and more light coming out. Which is why it's a beautiful symbol. This year we're going to celebrate Christmas with a midnight mass at midnight. And with a candlelight service. Why is a candlelight service so significant for Christmas? Because those candles, that light represents who? Christ, the light of the world. Every time we see candles on the altar, who do those candles signify? That's a symbol of Christ, the light of the world. What about on our Christmas trees? When we see lights on our Christmas trees, who do those lights represent? Christ, the light of the world. Every time you look at your Christmas tree, 
thank Christ. They symbolize Christ. 